antagonists. In a way, terrible though that situation is, I hope you agree, it's almost what one might have come to expect. <coughs> and interesting as that phenomenon has been, it's not as interesting to me as the emergence of a reaction against it. And what's been most interesting about the reaction against that dominant intellectual conversation is that the reaction has come from within the left. Some of you might have seen The Observer yesterday, um, and uh, in it you will might have noticed an extract from a new book by uh, an Observer columnist, Nick Cohen, who places himself unambiguously on the left. Um, I'm going to um, beg your forgiveness because I'm going to quote in extenso from Nick's work and also from one or two others as I attempt to show you what I mean by this backlash from within the left. Why is it, Nick writes, that apologies for a militant Islam which stands for everything the liberal left is against come from the liberal left? Why will students hear a leftish postmodern theorist defend the exploitation of women in traditional cultures but not a crusty conservative dom? After the American and British wars in Bosnia and Kosovo against Slobodan Milosevic's ethnic cleansers, why were men and women of the left denying the existence of Serb concentration camps? As important, why did a European Union that daily announces its commitment to liberal principles of human rights and international law do nothing as crimes against humanity took place just over its borders? Why is Palestine a cause of the liberal, liberal left, but not China, Sudan, Zimbabwe, the Congo, or North Korea? Why, even in the case of Palestine, can't those who say that they support the Palestinian cause tell you what type of Palestine they would like to see? After the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, why are you as likely to read that a sinister conspiracy of Jews controlled American or British foreign policy in a superior literary journal as in a neo-Nazi hate sheet? He's referring there, of course, to the London Review of Books. And why, after the 7-7 attacks on London, did leftish rather than right-wing newspapers run pieces excusing suicide bombers who were inspired by a psychopathic theology from the ultra-right? In short, why is the world upside down? In the past, conservatives made excuses for fascism because they mistakenly saw it as a continuation of their democratic right-wing ideas. Now, overwhelmingly and everywhere, um, liberals and leftists are far more likely than conservatives to excuse fascistic governments and movements with the exception of their own native far-right parties. As long as local racists are white, they have no difficulty in opposing them in a manner that would have been recognisable to the traditional left. But give them a foreign far-right movement that is anti-Western, and they treat it as at best a distraction and as at worst an ally. Now, I couldn't have put it better myself. And indeed, it's similar, though much more eloquent, than the arguments that I try to make in my book Celsius 7-7. But what's striking about Nick's intervention is that it's not a conservative MP attacking the left. It's someone who was raised in a left-wing household, has worked on his life for left-wing newspapers, and to this day still considers himself to be a figure on the left. Now, if it were just Nick, no one could argue that he was one person from whose eyes the scales had fallen. And one might think that he might be embarking on an intellectual or political journey similar to those someone like Melanie Phillips, who self-consciously moved from the left to a position which I think, with all respect to Melanie, I can fairly say is just about on the centre right. Um, but the interesting, the interesting thing about, uh, about uh, Nick's book is that uh, uh, the reaction to it and the conversation around it reveals that he's not a lone voice. If you were, however, to visit The Guardian's commented free website and look at some of the comments that Nick's book has attracted, you might think that he was an increasingly lonely and embattled figure. But if you discount some of those voices and look instead at the quality of the people who come to support him, um, then um, uh, you can see that Nick is actually at the heart of a coalescing group, an anti-Islamist intelligentsia. Um, let me refer to Christopher Hitchens, uh, who was reviewing Nick's book in the Sunday Times this Sunday. Um, and he, this is what he had to say. Um, just in the past decade, decade ago, had the anti-war rabble had its way, we would have seen Kuwait stay part of Iraq, Bosnia and Kosovo cleansed and annexed by Greater Serbia, and the Taliban retaining control of Afghanistan. You might think that such a record would lead its adherents to be dismissed as a silly and sinister fringe. But instead, it is they who pose as the principled radicals, and their opponents, 
who are treated with unconcealed disdain in the universities and on the BBC. This betrayal, because there is no other word for it, has been made possible in part by a degraded version of multiculturalism. The hard left has jumped its historic secularism to say nothing of its principles of equality for females and homosexuals, to make common cause with Muslim outfits, some of which are associated in other countries with the extreme right. It has done this by the use of nonsense terms such as Islamophobia, which are designed to give the no less nonsensical impression that Islam is some kind of persecuted ethnicity. But the vile attacks on Islamists, sorry, the vile attacks by Islamists on the Jews, Britain's oldest minority, and on India, Britain's most important democratic ally after the United States, show the truly reactionary and hateful character of the opportunist alliance between failed ex-Stalinists and fanatical theocrats. It's important to stress again that Christopher Hitchens is unambiguously a man of the left. And there are others in British journalism as well who take a similar view. Um, David Aronovich, who used to write for the, um, uh, the Guardian and the Observer, and who now writes in the Times, has been, I think, brave and principled in his denunciation of uh, Claire Short, Jenny Tung, and a number of other figures who have used weasel words in an attempt to excuse Islamist violence. And in mentioning David Aronovich, I should also mention John Lloyd, uh, the editor of the Financial Times magazine and the former editor of the New Statesman. Someone who, like everyone I've mentioned before, is still on the left, someone who would still, if and when they vote in this country, vote for the Labour Party uh, with uh, varying degrees of enthusiasm. Um, uh, John Lloyd, in, uh, again, writing in The Guardian's comment as free section, um, uh, denounced Islamism, particularly with reference, funnily enough, uh, to the uh, Republican ideology that animated the provisional IRA. Um, and he says that uh, ideology, uncompromising, appealing to purity of thought and actions, murderous, is required to give real or imagined wrongs a framework, a cause and both a battle cry and a battle order. You must fight for something as well as against something. And one of the most powerful of such ideologies has been in very different forms an appeal to oneness. Oneness of nation and ethnos, Nazism. Oneness of class and party, communism. And oneness of faith, state and thought, Islamism. Again, in my own book, uh, I tried to draw the parallels between fascism, communism and Islamism and tried to argue that they were all different branches of totalitarian ideology. Again, it's possible to discount that view coming as it does from a conservative MP. It's much more difficult to discount it when it comes from someone like John Lloyd, who spent their entire political career on the left. But it's not just journalists, and not just that coterie for journalists, who have made, I think, dramatic and important interventions. I also wanted to mention three novelists as well. I first wanted to mention Ian McEwan. His work, Saturday, seems to me to be one of the uh, uh, most honest uh, fictional treatments of the whole question of the morality of intervention. And in Saturday, the arguments are very finely balanced, more finely balanced than you'll find, for example, in most today program discussions. Um, but one of the interesting things is that when McEwan has been speaking uh, uh, outside fiction, how candid and direct he's been. Um, this is McEwan speaking to Der Spiegel. We're going to have to start seeing around the preposterous political correctness that allows us to have radical clerics preaching in mosques and recruiting young people. We have been caught too much by a sense that we can just regard these clerics as being like English eccentrics at Hyde Park Corner. But the problem is, their audience has already been to training camps. I want to put to Ian McEwan that in fact the real cause of terrorism lay in uh, the actions of America and the West. Uh, he was robust. I don't think terror needs a breeding ground, he said. I don't buy the arguments in the Iraq war. What keeps getting forgotten here is that the people committing massacres in Iraq right now belong to al-Qaeda. We're witnessing a civil war that's taking place in Israel. The most breathtaking statement was the one of al-Qaeda claiming responsibility for the London bombings, saying it was in return for the massacre in Iraq. But the massacres in Iraq now are being conducted by al-Qaeda against Muslims. I also think it's extraordinary the way in which we get morally selective in our outrages. When there was a rumour that someone at Guantanamo Bay had flushed a Koran down the lavatory, the pages in The Guardian almost caught fire with outrage. But only a month before, the Taliban had set fire to a mosque and destroyed...